We need to have some way to know whether we're moving forward and whether we're moving in the right direction or whether or not we're getting caught up in things that don't necessarily matter. Hey, it's Rick Kettner here. Welcome back to The Startup Blog. This is episode number 12. And in this episode, we're gonna talk about how to choose the best startup metrics. This is very important because it's critical that we have an accurate and reliable way to track the progress of our startup. And the unfortunate reality is there are metrics out there that can seem important, but ultimately serve as a distraction. They give us the illusion of progress, but we aren't actually, if we follow those metrics, moving towards building a sustainable business. We're simply just increasing certain numbers that aren't actually important. So it's very critical that we gain a deep understanding over the metrics that matter and how to measure progress over time. So in this episode, we're gonna tackle three things. We're gonna talk about the pirate metrics model, how I'm applying the model within my startup, and my favorite metrics and the way that I think about business and growing business over time. So let's begin with the pirate metrics model. This is a framework that was first established by venture capitalist Dave McClure. And the reason why it's called the pirate metrics model is because it's a five-part acronym with A-A-R-R-R. So when you pronounce it, it sounds like R, like a pirate. So the acronym stands for acquisition, activation, retention, referral, and revenue. Now, depending on your precise business model, these different words can stand for different things in your business. But what is important is that you get a very clear sense of how to apply this model to your business so you can have a better sense of the kinds of things that you wanna be monitoring and improving as your startup moves forward. So let's go through each of these really quickly. Acquisition, is defined as the number of people that become first time customers. Now, there are other ways to think about acquisition. Some people will consider simply attracting a new lead or a new prospect or a new potential customer as acquiring something to the business. Now, personally, I prefer to define it as acquiring a new customer, but of course, depending on your model, a new customer might not actually be someone who spends money with you. You might be running a platform like Facebook or YouTube or something like that where you're simply bringing on users. But what I would avoid doing, and this is a trap some people fall into, is they just simply consider anybody that visits their website the acquisition of a new potential lead. And the problem with that strategy is there's really no way to identify whether or not it's the same person coming back to your page on a different internet connection or on a different device. And so you don't really have a way to differentiate one lead or one customer from another. So my definition for this is first time customers, but you might also consider leads or prospects or something like that, so long as you can actually track them individually and independently. Now next up we have activation. This is a very important metric and the idea here is once you acquire a new customer, you need them to activate and actually start using your product or service. So typically you might measure activation based on having somebody go through an onboarding process or actually unbox and put together your product or service, depending on what it is that you're ultimately offering, the key differentiation here is instead of just having somebody pay for your service, you want to have them engage with it in a meaningful way. And so again, with let's say an online SaaS tool, it might be completing the onboarding process. With something like a book, it might be them opening the book for the very first time and find some finding some creative way to track that. But the difference here is, Somebody can become a customer without actually engaging with the product and you wanna find some way to track that in a meaningful way. Next up, we have retention. And this comes down to how long you are able to retain a customer. And as with the previous two metrics, there are multiple ways to interpret this. The typical way for, let's say, a subscription service is how long you can keep a customer maintaining their subscription. But even in the case of a one-time purchase, you might find a creative way to track how long they use your product before they end up setting it aside or being finished with it or something like that. You wanna find a way to measure how long that customer continues to engage either with your product or with your business and you need to define what retention looks like for your particular startup. Next up we have referral. 
And this is the rate at which customers refer other customers. And again, depending on how you're tracking things here, let's say you're running a free platform like Facebook, well, you might track referrals as simply a free user inviting another free user. So there are many ways to think about these things, but at the end of the day, referral, pretty straightforward. You're trying to track whether or not existing users or customers are inviting other people to engage with your business in a similar way. And last but not least is revenue. And this is typically defined as the total revenue generated from each customer. And usually you would track this based on how long they've been a customer. So for example, total revenue within the first three months of becoming a customer or the first six months or the first year or something like that. Because of course, you don't wanna bring your averages down with brand new customers that have just made their very first purchase. You wanna look at these things based on how long somebody has been a customer. And with all all of these metrics, ideally, you want to be able to track them independently. So you can track certain groups, certain cohorts, you can track things within certain windows of time. So you can see how one year or one time period relates to a previous time period. You wanna have a clear way that you can measure these things over time to see whether or not your startup is moving in the right direction. Now, next up, let's talk about how I'm applying the model within my own startup. As I've kind of alluded to, there are many different ways to apply this framework based on what it is that you are offering to customers and how it is that you're choosing to define each of these stages. So I thought, Talking about it within the context of what it is that I'm doing might give you a pretty good example of how you might try to think about these things. Now, as I've talked about throughout this series, the very first product for my startup is a book. So I thought, why don't we talk about each of these within the context of selling a book? So let's begin with acquisition. Probably the easiest way to measure this would be the total number of people that buy the book. I can track the number of people that buy it on any given platform. I can track the number of people that buy it in, let's say, physical form versus digital versus perhaps an audiobook version that I might release at some point in the future. So pretty straightforward to simply track the total number of people that purchase the book. Then when it comes to activation, I think the easiest way to measure activation is the total number of people that start to read the book. In other words, they don't just buy the book and then put it on a shelf somewhere. I wanna track the total number of people that take the book home and actually crack it open and begin to read the content. Now, might not be easy to track this, but one idea is to offer some kind of a bonus relatively early on in the content where I have some kind of a cheat sheet or some kind of a value add or some other, let's say a PDF resource that they can go online and register for and download. Something like this so that as they begin to read the book, some portion of people that are reading it will then engage, they'll go visit the website, they'll download this resource, they'll provide their email address, something like that. And even though this isn't perfect, it'll give me a rough sense of the number of people that are beginning to read the book. And of course, I can watch whether or not that is improving or whether it's decreasing over time. So as I acquire more and more readers, is that number going up or is it kind of staying flat? It's at least some way to measure activation, even though again, probably not perfect. And perhaps I will come up with a better strategy for measuring activation. Next up, we have retention. And I think that probably the best way to track this in the short term is to track the number of people that complete the book using a similar strategy. Perhaps late in the book, I can offer another value add, another resource, perhaps a video, that kind of covers the key themes of the book in more detail or just kind of recaps them, that sort of thing, and kind of mention this close to the end of the book so that it's only really people that make it pretty deep into the book that discover this additional bonus. And thus, again, it's not a perfect measurement, but it's a way to see that some portion of people are making it to the end of the book. And even if it isn't perfect, it's a number that I can see whether or not it's improving over time, whether it's declining. So as I perhaps iterate and improve the book, then I can see whether or not that number is going up. Now, of course, another lens by which you might look at this figure of retention is whether or not they go on to buy additional products and services that I might offer in the future. So there are many different ways to think about this, but 
initially, I think focusing on simply tracking the number of people that complete the book seems like a more helpful metric. And another thing that's just coming to mind right now is I could actually base this on the number of people that rate the book on a platform like Amazon or Goodreads or Apple Books. That's probably, in fact, an even better approach that just kind of came to me right now as an obvious alternative to offering an additional bonus late in the book. So there are all kinds of ways at the end of the day that you can tackle these sorts of things. Now, next up we have referral. And in this case, the most obvious option is to try to find some way to track the number of people that read the book or buy the book and then recommend it to other potential readers. Now, of course, this can be very difficult to track. I could try to come up with some sort of a referral code program or something like that, almost certainly gonna be very messy. So what I've landed on, and this is far from perfect, it's a bit of an indirect measurement, but the way that I'm gonna likely think about this is simply by tracking how high people rate the book. So the ratio of five-star ratings to everything else, or perhaps four and five star ratings to compared to everything else. And the reason for this is because twofold. Number one, when somebody rates a book of four or five stars, typically they're more likely to recommend that product or that book to other people. And furthermore, in the case of books specifically, high ratings play a major role in people's purchasing decisions. So when I go find a book on a platform like Goodreads or Amazon, if there are a lot of people that have rated the book and the rating is really high, well, I'm more likely to buy the book. So even if somebody didn't specifically recommend it to me, there is kind of an indirect referral in the sense that I'm being influenced by the way that other people rate a book. So I figured this is probably a pretty helpful measurement not perfect, but as is the case that in general that I'm trying to achieve here, it's useful. It's useful information. If I'm not getting enough five-star ratings, if I'm not getting enough four-star ratings, well, I probably need to go back and revisit and improve the book, gather feedback, find out what's missing, find out what I'm doing a poor job of explaining, and basically just figure out where I'm going wrong. What is the book failing to do? How am I failing to deliver the advice or the information that people need? need and want to get from the book. So that's the way that I plan to track referrals. Now, last but not least is revenue. Now, this is probably the least applicable, at least at this stage for me, but the way that I'm thinking about revenue or the way that I intend to measure revenue is the price point for each sale. So eventually I'm probably gonna focus more on total lifetime customer value and the number of people that buy the book and then eventually buy either a follow-up book or an add-on service or something like that. But in the short term, since I will be offering the book in multiple formats, including physical, digital, and audiobook, I think it will be helpful to track the average revenue per customer, not just the sales price, but also the profit, so I can figure out things like advertising and other potential options like that to market the book and to reach a larger audience. Now, when it comes to my favorite metrics and the way that I like to think about business and business growth, I tend to focus on engagement-based metrics. So things like activation, referral, retention, these kinds of metrics tend to be more predictive of future success. Now, it's worth noting that metrics like acquisition and revenue, especially really early on in the startup journey, these things are very important. They're the lifeblood of an organization. If you don't have new customers coming in the door, if you don't have revenue coming in, then the startup can simply fail because you don't have the money to keep the operation moving. However, if all you do is obsess about bringing in more customers and more initial revenue, what you can do is end up finding yourself in a position where for every new customer that's coming in the door, you have another customer leaving the business, perhaps a few weeks or a few months down the road. So they're coming in and then they aren't really finding value from your products and services. They aren't engaging with them. They aren't using them. They don't love what it is that you're offering. And so a few months later, they're disengaged and you've lost that customer. You're not able to generate additional revenue from them. And even in the case of a one-time purchase, they're not recommending your product or your service to other people to help your business grow. And so while it is important to generate revenue and to track the acquisition of new customers, I tend to focus on things like activation and retention and referral because they tend to be much more predictive of future success. 
but you need to find a balance. You need to find a balance between making sure that you have revenue coming in and making sure that people are enjoying your product, they're using your product, and they're recommending it to other people because that is what's gonna allow your business to build meaningful momentum, where every new customer coming in the door stays with your business, they continue to use your product, perhaps they continue to pay you, or at very least, they're recommending your product and service to other people, which allows your business to steadily grow over time. You can continue to generate revenue from existing customers, even as you attract new customers, and in many ways, again, if there is strong referral, those existing customers are helping you attract more and more customers, which can allow you to build momentum and really have things snowball over time. So with all of that in mind, when it comes to my startup, and in particular, the book that I'm going to be releasing, I'll be focusing on tracking the number of people that read the book, complete the book, rate the book, and recommend or refer the book to other potential readers. Those are the metrics that I feel are most predictive of future potential success. But anyway, that's it for this episode. But in the very next episode, we're gonna continue to build on this theme and talk about how to build a growth equation for your startup, how to put together the most important metrics into an equation that you can use to figure out where you should be focusing your energy to grow your startup faster. So that's what we're going to cover in the very next episode. If you have any questions or comments about anything that we covered in this episode or things that you would like to see covered in future episodes, let me know down in the comment section. And of course, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on future episodes. Thank you for tuning in and I look forward to connecting with you again in the next episode.